Committee of the House of Representatives with Mr. Draghi, President of the European Central Bank. This uh, meeting is an uh, initiative proposal by Arnold, M Arnold Merkies, former member of the Parliament of the Socialist Party and fully supported by the whole Finance uh, Committee. Uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, Mr. Draghi. A warm welcome to, you, sir, to your support staff. Thank you for uh, 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 accepting this, uh, this invitation. The order of, uh, of the meeting is the meeting will run from uh, 1 to exactly 3 o'clock. Um, and it, the order will be as follows. Uh, first of all, Mr. Draghi will, do, uh, will make an introduction uh, statement, which will take about 10 to 15 uh, minutes. And uh, after that, we will have a discussion in three uh, topical blocks which are prepared by a selection of the members of parliament. And the three topical blocks are questions on the necessity of the monetary policy of the ECB, and it will be run by Mr. Van Dijk and uh, Ms. Schouten. The second block will be on the effects, unwan unwanted side effects and risks of the monetary policy of the ECB, and that block will be run by Mr. Harbers, Mr. Van Weyenberg and Mr. Snells. And the third block will be on the institutional position and mandate of the ECB regarding monetary policy. And that block will be run by Mr. Omtzigt and uh, Ms. Leijten. Um, I mentioned a number of the names. The other members, and we've, we've made sort of order arrangements uh, with each other as a finance committee, there will be uh, uh, plenty of possibility for all members to ask uh, questions. Uh, so uh, that will um, take care of, it, uh, of itself. Now, that's actually uh, uh, that is the order. Then the first part of the agenda, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Draghi for his introduction statement. Mr. Draghi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable members of parliament, this year we celebrate the 60th and the 25th anniversaries of the treaties of Rome and Maastricht. Despite the many challenges that we face as Europeans, we should never forget the significant achievements of European integration in providing peace, security, and prosperity. The fact that the treaty that gave birth to the Euro was signed in this country symbolizes the enduring role of the Netherlands at the forefront of this European project. I'm therefore honored to be invited to speak here at the Dutch Parliament. Thank you. Today's event offers an opportunity to provide insight into the ECB's decisions and to listen to your views. It's indeed important for the ECB to reach out to all Euro area citizens and their representatives to explain how we fulfill our mandate. The EU treaties democratically conferred upon the ECB the primary objective of maintaining price stability in the euro area as a whole. This objective binds my colleagues and me on the ECB's governing council, where our decisions are the result of a collegial debate. And we are held accountable for our decisions by all European Union citizens through their representatives in the European Parliament. In my remarks today, I would like to expand on three points. First, I want to show how a very severe double deep crisis required the ECB to deploy unconventional instruments to ensure price stability. And our measures are proving effective. Incoming data, confirmed that the cyclical recovery of the euro area economy is becoming increasingly solid and that downside risks have diminished. Second, I will discuss the possible side effects of these measures and I will consider the different dimensions in which our monetary policy affects people's finances and welfare, which are sometimes overlooked in the recent debate. Finally, I will outline why the ECB cannot be the only actor contributing to the recovery. 
other economic, financial, and fiscal policies are necessary to ensure a sustained recovery. So let me start talking about recovering from the crisis and the role of our monetary policy. And let me start by recalling where we came from. The Great Recession, as it is called today, resulted in a protracted period of low inflation and low growth. Specifically, the euro area faced two interlinked and successive crises, a financial crisis in 2008 and a sovereign debt crisis that started to emerge in 2011 and derailed the rebound. The recovery that began in mid-2013 lost steam in the summer of 2014 as the external environment became more uncertain. At the beginning of 2014, credit growth was contracting at an annual pace of more than 3%, while overall economic growth was stalling. Since the start of 2013, inflation had drifted consistently away from the ECB's target rate of below but close to 2% over the medium term, reaching levels below 1%. Without counteracting measures, this low inflation could have turned into a deflationary spiral, which would have deepened our, economics, our, our economy's woes considerably. It was against this macroeconomic background that the ECB took decisive policy action to maintain price stability in the euro area as a whole in line with its mandate. In normal times, when inflation is above target, central banks raise the key interest rates to rein it in. When inflation is below target, they lower the key interest rates to stimulate economic activity and induce an increase in inflation. However, at the start of 2014, the deposit facility rate had already been brought to zero. At the same time, financial fragmentation in the euro area was hampering the transmission of our policy, as our monetary policy impulses were not evenly transmitted across countries or adequately along the yield curve. So, in order to provide additional monetary accommodation and to support the recovery in credit, the ECB used a range of non-standard measures to meet its inflation objective. These measures include a negative deposit facility rate, targeted long-term refinancing operations, forward guidance, and asset purchases. Net asset purchases currently amount to 60 billion euro per month and are intended to run until the end of December 2017 or beyond if necessary. These measures aim to influence short and longer term interest rates, asset prices, and loan volumes, thereby fostering economic growth and supporting price stability. The ECB's actions were not unique. Central banks in the United States, Japan, and United Kingdom also used asset purchases while central banks in, for example, Sweden and Switzerland also reduced key interest rates to below zero. Our measures have been very effective. They have led to very favorable financing conditions. Since mid-2014, bank lending rates for both firms and households have dropped by more than 100 basis points. And we have witnessed a pronounced convergence in borrowing conditions across both euro area countries and types of borrowers. These favorable financing conditions have in turn supported the economic recovery. Let me give you a few data on that because often it's overlooked. For 15 conse consecutive quarters, euro area quarterly GDP, GDP growth, has been consistently between 0.3 and 0.8% quarterly growth. In 2016, GDP per capita grew faster in the euro area 
than in any other major advanced economy in the world. Four and a half million jobs were created in the last three years. And unemployment in the euro area is at its lowest point since May 2009. Our monetary policy has successfully stabilized inflation expectations. In our March ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, the, the outlook for headline inflation has been revised upwards significantly for 2017 and slightly for 2018, and unchanged for 2019. And these projections now foresee an annual headline inflation at 1.7 in 2017, 1.6 in 18, 1.7 in 19. Now, the staff projections, this is very important to remember, the staff projections are conditional on the full implementation of all our monetary policy measures. So, similar to what we have observed at the euro area level, economic expansion in the Netherlands has also strengthened. GDP grew at 2.2% in 2016, driven by strong domestic demand on account of improving business and consumer confidence and positive wealth and real income effects. In addition, unemployment has steadily decreased, registering at 5.1% in March 2017. And the Netherlands has more jobs now than before the crisis. Supported by low interest rates and a strengthening recovery, the Dutch government ran a 2.9 billion euro surplus last year, its first surplus since 2008. And as an export-oriented country, the Netherlands is currently benefiting from the recovery in other euro area countries, especially as growth in global trade remains tepid. Let me now say a few words about the side effects of our policies. I'm aware that these very accommodative financing conditions have raised various concerns also in this House. Monetary policy measures always have side effects. But so far, the potential negative side effects have been limited. We are monitoring these effects very, very carefully taking into account our price stability mandate. To ascertain the overall impact of our measures on our citizens, it's important to differentiate between the various ways in which they affect economic actors, such as households, pension funds, and banks. Let me start with the households. An accommodative monetary policy means households accrue fewer nominal returns on their savings. However, an accommodative monetary policy supports the economic recovery, which in turn bolsters employment, income, returns on investments, and tax revenues. It therefore benefits households in their capacity as workers, entrepreneurs, investors, borrowers, and taxpayers. Similarly, there are several channels through which our policies affect pension systems. Yes, lower rates increase the present value of future liabilities of pension schemes. However, the liability side of the pension schemes is only one part of the equation. What happens on the, on the asset side is also important. And our monetary policy has had a beneficial impact on this side of the equation as the value of investment portfolio has increased. Also, let's not forget that our monetary policy supports pension systems indirectly by supporting employment growth and thus pension contributions. In any case, it's ultimately up to sound governance structures and long-term strategies to ensure the financial health of pension systems. Equally, monetary policy can have an impact on banks' profitability through various channels. Our assessment is that so far, these effects tend to largely offset each other in aggregate terms. 
low rates might reduce bank profits through the narrowing of net interest margins. Yet, at the same time, by supporting the recovery, accommodative monetary policy reduces delinquencies and defaults, including defaults on mortgages. Improved credit quality coupled with higher lending volumes and an improved market value of assets supports bank profitability. Of course, depending on the strength of their balance sheet, some banks may be more affected than others. Also, and we have to be careful here not to confuse the two aspects, banks facing structurally high cost to income ratios or limited diversification of income sources might have to revamp their business models regardless of the low interest environment. Finally, let me also address the risk of overheating in some parts of the financial markets. We do not currently see compelling evidence of overstretched asset valuations at the euro area level. You should keep this in mind. We, we can see local things, but not at a euro area level. But we do see the real estate dynamics or high household debt levels in some countries signal the risk of increasing imbalances. Such risks also exist in the Netherlands. They relate to the continued very high level of household indebtedness and the low level of mortgage collateralization. For this reason, we share the concerns expressed in a warning issued by the European Systemic Risk Board in November 2016 and recognize that there is a case for mitigating measures. That being said, monetary policy is not the appropriate tool for addressing local and sectoral financial risks. Rather, targeted macroprudential policies which can be tailored to local and sectoral conditions are the right answer. Against the backdrop of a recovery that's becoming increasingly solid, the benefits of our policy clearly outweigh potential side effects. Also due to the pass-through of our monetary policy, there is now more and more evidence that economic growth is firming and broadening. Incoming data confirm that the cyclical recovery of the euro area economy is becoming increasingly solid and that downside risks have further diminished. Nevertheless, it is too early to declare success. Underlying inflation pressures continue to remain subdued and have yet to show a convincing upward trend. The domestic drivers of inflation, namely wages, are not yet responding to the recovery and the narrowing output gap. So maintaining the current very substantial degree of monetary accommodation is still needed for underlying inflation, inflation pressures to build up and support headline inflation in the medium term. However, beyond the contribution of monetary policy, we also need measures to address the legacy of the crisis, lift potential growth and upgrade our economic, economic ecosystem to increase resilience to future shocks. And this requires action at member states level. Ambitious, country-specific structural reforms are needed to raise productivity, make economies more resilient, and address persistent fragilities, including those inherited by the crisis. And member states need to pursue prudent fiscal policies to build up buffers for difficult times. National parliaments can play a central role in supporting such efforts. Our accommodative monetary policy provides a window of opportunity for pursuing such policies, for example, by alleviating some of the short-run costs of structural reforms. Action at the European level is also required. The crisis has revealed significant fragilities, not only at member state level, but also in the economic governance of economic and monetary union. Some of the fragilities could be addressed already by applying the common rules we have all agreed on. Others, however, need to be addressed by upgrading our governance. How? 
Banking union needs to be completed by making parallel progress on risk reduction and risk sharing. And this includes adopting the European Commission's risk reduction package, which, among other things, implements some of the remaining Basel III reforms and further strengthens prudential rules in the banking sector. At the same time, we need to establish a European deposit insurance scheme and a common backstop to the single resolution fund. Ambitious progress towards a fully-fledged capital markets union would also create more effective channels of private risk sharing in the euro area and reduce the need for fiscal stabilization. Let me conclude. The euro area has certainly faced its fair share of challenges in recent years, but things are clearly improving. In the euro area, the economic recovery has evolved from being fragile and uneven into firming broad-based upswing. And ECB's monetary policy measures have been supporting this recovery. We have established four criteria to confirm a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with our definition of price stability in the medium term that would warrant a scaling back of the current degree of monetary policy accommodation. First, headline inflation should be on a path to levels below but close to 2% over the meaningful medium-term horizon. Second, inflation should be durable and stabilized around those levels with sufficient confidence. Third, inflation will have to be self-sustaining, meaning it will maintain its trajectory even with diminishing support from monetary policy. And finally, I would say, obviously, the relevant metric in each case is euro area inflation, not the inflation rates of any individual country. However, in order to reap the benefits of our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute much more decisively to strengthening economic growth. And this depends on the policies pursued by member states, where national parliaments, as I said, have a key role to play but also depends on our collective ability to further strengthen the architecture of economic and monetary union in a way that fully reflects the interdependence among the euro area economies. Pursuing such policies will ensure a higher growth trajectory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm now at your disposal for questions, and I apologize because I exceeded your time limit. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I give the... F uh, please push the... Yeah. Also, when you answer questions later on, we will have to push buttons every time. Um, I now give the floor for the first uh, set of questions which, uh, uh, which are uh, managed by uh, uh, Mr. Schouten of the Christian Union and Mr. Van Dijk of the PVV, the Party for Freedom. And it's on the necessity of the ECB monetary policy. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Draghi, welcome in our midst, brave also, because you may be a hero in Italy, you may be a hero in the southern debt countries, and in, in the world of uh, investors like uh, Goldman Sachs and the banks, but here in Holland, you're not a hero because our pension savings evaporated and you call it a side effect, but for us, the Dutch people, it's a big, big effect, uh, what you did by the QE. And the question is, was QE necessary? You talk about uh, interest rates, you lower the interest rates, uh, you, the euro, you make the euro a little cheaper, that's good for export. But I think QE as a package was not necessary. And the question we had one year ago when we invited you, that was one year ago, uh, the question then was, is QE not the wrong medicine? Because QE was on the, on the road for a year. Inflation was still negative. So economy had a standstill. So was there any inf influence of QE on the economy and on the inflation that was not the case one year ago? Now, one year later, economy is uh, still a little bit growing. Inflation is 1.9. And the question is, was this caused by QE or was it caused by the world economy, the low oil prices, 
the interest rates and the cheap euro. So my first question is, was QE necessary? And with the interest rates we have now, is it still necessary to continue with QE? Because 1.9% was your goal, and you reached your goal, so you can quit with QE. Another question I have is, who profited the most of QE? Because uh, there was a year ago, uh, people spoke about helic helicopter money, because the QE money didn't come into the economy. And the question is, if it's not getting to the people and the real economy, who was profiting of QE? Were it only the debt countries, like Italy, who, who had a low interest rate on the southern debt? Was it the investors who get a high price for their southern bonds? Or were it the banks who were able to swap the bad assets for good assets? So my question is, who were the benefits of your policy and of QE? Well, first of all, <clears throat> just to answer by the fact that I'm not an hero, or I'm an hero, or where I'm an hero, uh, actually, it's not my job to be a hero, but just to pursue my mandate. And my mandate is price stability. And that was what was at stake exactly at the beginning of QE. And that's the reason why we had QE, to comply with our mandate, as we are bound by the law. The, um, I said that we are aware of the effects of QE on uh, QE, and generally, more generally. By the way, you touched on QE, but in fact, interest rates are low also because of the negative rates. But that somehow was not raising the same concerns as QE. That's, that's the question I have. But you know, interest rates are low for the combined effects of the two measures, and because of our forward guidance, and as a symptom of the, uh, of the crisis uh, that was there. It's a legacy of uh, a situation which was very close to deflation. And that explains the need of our measures. As I said in my introductory statement, interest rates had already gone to zero. And that explains why we had to move, like, by the way, many other central banks in the rest of the world, in US, in UK, in Japan, and everywhere else. So it was not, it was not uh, unique to our own policy. It was necessary, yes. Are we seeing the outcome? Yes. We saw the data before, employment data, job creation, credit data, flows, spreads, interest rates. I will not go through the list again, although we can do it later on again. But also for the Netherlands, benefited enormously from, uh, from the uh, monetary policy that uh, has been in place uh, in, uh, in the last few years. Uh, coming to pensions, it's quite clear. We are aware of these effects. It, low interest rates increase the value of liabilities, but as I said, also increase the value of assets. It is also true that they reduce the return on investment. So it's a combined effect. And this combined effect is certainly not positive in the short run. But two considerations. First of all, we have to judge the ultimate effect on pension funds over a longer horizon. Pension funds have to survive periods with low rates, high rates, and uh, it's not the first time that rates were low and real rates were negative. We can go back to the 70s, to the 80s of the last century, rates have gone, real rates especially, have, have been uh, different levels. But the other reason is that our monetary policy has supported the economy, has produced, basically has been one of the major factors behind the current recovery, and therefore has supported employment, has in increasing contributions to the pension funds, and generally speaking, increasing the welfare of people is also uh, a main point in support of the pension funds. But there's also another more general consideration that I want to make. Interest rates go down and then go up, and uh, economies as well 
we are, we are now in, a positive, uh, in the positive part of a business cycle. But we should ask a more fundamental question. How can we, and we say we, I mean all countries, not only the Netherlands, continue paying pensions with an aging society? And that's where we probably would do better focusing our attention on how we raise potential output, output growth in the long term. And for that, monetary policy is fundamentally n irrelevant. For that, we need structural reforms, we need infrastructure, we need investments in education. And I think collectively, we should focus our attention on that, because as the recovery will improve, and as it is improving, natural interest rates will also go up again. But the real challenge is the long-term challenge. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, you asked me who profited from the, uh, from the QE. Who profited the most? It's interesting. Uh, let me answer this. First of all, uh, the, the economy as a whole profited. Unemployment has reached levels that we haven't seen since 2009, 2008. So workers, employment, entrepreneurs profited. But you seem to imply that somehow investors profited more. Well, we've asked ourselves this question, whether, uh, whether QE increases income inequality, because after all, asset prices go up because we buy assets, therefore asset prices go up, and the ones who hold assets have a capital gain. And certainly, for example, banks' profits banks' capital positions went up and, and certainly benefited. At the same time, of course, we have negative interest rates on our deposit facility, which is hurting banks. But the question is whether the QE has increased inequality or not. And the answer is no, because what is the best measure we have to decrease inequality? Is to increase employment, to create jobs, and on that, we have a very strong evidence. More than four and a half, four, four million and a half jobs have been created in the last three or four years, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Ms. Gauten. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Draghi, also from my side, um, also for being here. Um, you talked about the necessity of the program and also the necessity of um, structural reforms in uh, the member states. Um, is it true that uh, when you decided to start the program and to lower the interest rate, that um, it was also to give the Southern European countries time, to give the Southern European countries the time to restructure their economy to take uh, the necessary structural reforms, and by that, that the northern European countries also would contribute by that, by, uh, because of the lower interest rate and uh, the pension funds. And on the other hand, is it also true that um, because of the program, um, there is no real uh, necessity anymore for the countries to reform their economies? So you structurally emphasize the, the, the necessity of structural economic reforms, but meanwhile, you give a lot of time to countries not to do that. We, um, our mandate asked to pursue price stability for the euro area as a whole not distinguishing between northern countries, southern countries, but price stability is our objective. First. Second, our mandate doesn't relate necessarily to create or destroy the incentives for countries and governments to pursue structural reforms. Uh, I've been asked many times whether low interest rates uh, do decrease the incentive to undertake structural reforms in different countries. And we've given to this uh, quite, quite a bit of thought and analysis. 
Now, the answer is, by and large, no. There is no relationship. And um, first of all, factually, the main reforms in the labor market that had taken place since the crisis have, take, have taken place when interest rates were already low. Second, such certain, what sort of structural reforms do we have in mind? In many countries, structural reforms have to do with changing the judiciary system, changing the education system, changing the constitution, changing the electoral law. Do you really think that they have to do with the level of interest rates? So, but there is one area where there is a relationship, and that's budget consolidation. Clearly, if uh, it's more difficult to finance a deficit, therefore there will be more incentive to consolidate the budget earlier. So the relationship is limited to budget consolidation. And uh, it's not the case that actually structural reforms are going to be undertaken for consolidating the budget. One doesn't change the educational system to consolidate the budget. Structural reforms follow a political cycle more, much more than an interest rate cycle. But also, let me ask you, do you really think it's the task of a central bank to stimulate the governments to undertake uh, structural reforms? We can point out the need for structural reforms, but we certainly, you know, I think we would agree that it would not be uh, legitimate from a democratic viewpoint to have a central bank that actually engages in a policy dialogue with governments for them to change the constitution or change the electoral system. The, so structural reforms follow a different logic by and large. Is the situation satisfactory, however? No, and there I would, I, I would agree with you. So for reasons other than our monetary policy, Structural reforms are lagging behind. Should we do, s please? I got some feeling that all the good effects of the program is because of the program, you say, and all the negative side effects is because of uh, the, 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 the national programs, what, what the, the, the national governments do. But isn't that, uh, is there some, really not something that is also, an, an, um, that it's related to, to what you are doing? No. Not at no, all? No, okay. exactly, no. The answer is absolutely no. Structural reforms have their own inner logic, and the argument that low interest rates reduce the incentive to undertake structural reforms doesn't stand scrutiny. We've looked to that. So it's with the exception, as I said, with the budget, where some consolidation may be put forward, but there we see a situation which, by and large, is better than it was before the crisis as far as budget consolidation is concerned. So, uh, but as I said, I would agree with you and with everybody who thinks that the situation is not satisfactory as far as structural reforms are concerned. They are lagging behind and we should think about doing something. And there are things we can discuss later about what can be done. Thank you. I would like to open the floor for other questions from uh, any other uh, members. Not from the public. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Van Raan, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Draghi, for your uh, coming here. Um, as ECB president, you're clearly not responsible for the way um, or type of investment companies can make as a result of your corporate sector um, program. Uh, but would you agree uh, that climate change is one of the most pressing challenges we're facing? And that one way, um, we face this challenge is to divest in fossil industries. And in this view, so this is the first question, and in this view, what is your opinion of the fact that the investments of the uh, 270 million a day, 53% seems to be within the energy and transport sector, uh, the likes of uh, Shell and uh, Volkswagen, which are not known for their divestment activities. So again, I acknowledge that you're not responsible for those uh, investments, but would it not be far better to have these uh, ECB investments help the energy transition in order to uh, fight climate change? What is your opinion on that? Thank you. Mr. Draghi. Thank you. Um, first, let me preface that saying that uh, the ECB and the Governing Council is fully aware of the problems of climate change, is um, 
it's very sensitive, and the ECB participates to various fora and various, uh, various capacity to that. As far as the specific program is concerned, I should say that it's been run with monetary policy considerations, risk management considerations, and giving a level playing field to all the actors in the program. However, the eligibility criteria have been quite broadly designed so that we end up, in fact, buying also lots of green assets. That is uh, what I can say. We are, not, uh, we are not excluding certain assets that you'd rather see sort of bought less or excluded, but we're also not excluding green assets. We're also buying into that. Short follow-up, Ms. Van Aan. Well, th uh, th that's uh, great news to hear, but the majority is still uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, f fossil and, and transport industries. And would you not agree that it uh, would be beneficial to have certain uh, stronger ecological and or welfare filters in your selection program? We should definitely have this in mind. But as I said, the program is predominantly designed with, designed with monetary policy and risk management considerations and also level playing field. So we should be able to come sort of compromise with all these three and four criteria, also with climate change. We're trying to do our best on that. Mr. Omtzigt, is the, Mr. Omtzigt is the next uh, question. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, to my, um, well, I was, I had a short hope that you would announce further tapering here within this, um, um, uh, within this house. But since you haven't, you will run into another problem by December. Namely, that by December, countries like Finland and the Netherlands, um, the European system of central banks will have bought about 33% of the debt. So you hit the limits, which you were hinting to, to Ms. Schouten. Are you then going to stretch and buy, make sure that central banks buy even more of the debts of these governments? Or are you going to relax the rules and allow the central bank to buy maybe 50% or whatever of the national debt of a member state? Mr. Uh, well, the answer is no, absolutely not. We have our rules, and they are in place. We periodically have discussions uh, whether uh, these rules should be, in a way, some, some members of the Governing Council think they could be changed, but the majority of the Governing Council has expressed several times in keeping the rules as they stand. And um, now you're saying there will be limits but in fact, our program is running smoothly. And um, so we intend to stick with our rules, which will never achieve the levels of debt that you, that you hinted at. So, short. Thank you. So that means that by the end of the year, when you have hit those limits for relevant countries in the Eurozone, like Finland and the Netherlands, you must stop the program, because otherwise you don't have an evenly distributed buying of the bonds because you would buy more of Italy or Germany, which have larger stocks of bonds than Finland or the Netherlands relative to their economy, because they have more state debt. And then you will stop the program, because you stick to the limits. Is that what I understand? No, that's, that's not foreseen. That's not foreseen. It would be certainly um, not what our forward guidance, based on the current information and the current assessment uh, uh, of the economy says. So we will see, uh, we will see that uh, our program continues smoothly, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, we'll stay with our rules. Thank you. The uh, next question is for Mr. Van Rooyen. I also have Ms. Leijten and Mr. Baudet on the list, and after that we move to the next block. So, Mr. Van Rooyen. I would like first to thank Mr. Draghi for his presence today. I would equally have liked to thank him for ECB's policy decisions over the past years, but I'm sorry to say it will not be possible. My party has serious issues with the ECB aggressive interest rate policies, and as will be made clear today, we do not stand alone on these matters. I have the following questions. The treaty defines the ECB primary goal as price stability. Has the ECB opinion and what definition of price stability shifted over the past years? Please elaborate. It's not clear what the consequences of discontinuing QE would be. What would be the consequences of interest rates in general 
if the ECB would discontinue its QE program tomorrow? How much would interest rates rise in countries like Italy, Spain and Portugal? And how much would interest rates rise in Euro, Euro countries like Germany and the Netherlands? Final question. With it, the Dutch pension system, the Dutch central bank mandates the use of a risk-free interest rate in order to calculate pension obligations many decades in the future. My question is, we presume you agree that these risk-free rates are affected by the ECB policy, QE policy, and we also presume you agree that these effects are temporary. Is that correct? Thank you. Uh, first, let me uh, say once again that our monetary policy measures, and here I continue the answer to my first question, really, m monetary policy measures were necessary. You may, um, I may have um, to stress this point, were absolutely necessary at the time. We had no contribution from external demand. We had no fiscal policy impulse. We had no endogenous propagation of growth. So there was nothing other than our monetary policy in 2014, 2013, and 14 when we started. Second, when our monetary policy will be sort of, when our forward guidance will change, when, our, when we will start exiting from this monetary policy. What is this? It's a meeting bell, so when the plenary session has a shift of the meeting, this oh, is so the bell, and you hear it. It's the end of your policy. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's oh, you thought it was every, every time you mentioned the word QE. The, the, the that's the yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, then uh, we, uh, we, will, um, we will naturally exit together with the improvement in the economy and, in the, and especially, of course, in our objective, in the path of inflation towards our objective. This will happen when, uh, as I said before, the inflation rate will durably converge towards our objective, and its convergence is uh, self-sustained, and it's going to be for the whole of the euro area. At that, point, at that point in time, interest rates will start going up, will start increasing. By the way, let me also say something that is often goes unnoticed in, in, uh, in policy debates. Even though our short-term rates are still negative, the deposit facility rate, rates along the yield curve have started to increase, naturally with the improved prospects of the euro area economy. Now, then your question is, will the southern countries, for example, just for example, be prepared at that point in time? Well, this, in a sense, is the same answer I gave about, uh, about the structural reforms. It's not our task to prepare countries for that event. Our task is to pursue price stability, no matter what is the state of preparation of these countries. Clearly, they had time to consolidate the budget, to undertake the needed structural reforms, and we will see what happens when we have to go out. But in, in, in deciding to study our strategy for the future, we have in mind only one thing, the objective of price stability. You also asked me about pension funds. Certainly, I, um, certainly our low interest rates have affected pension funds. And uh, also, surely, this uh, influence has not been positive, but it's a short-run influence. We have to judge pension funds, trajectories, pension fund strategies over a longer horizon. And, um, and there, the fact that our monetary policy has been essential, fundamental, for promoting the recovery is probably our greatest contribution to a return of pension funds to a situation of stability and solidity. Thank you. The next question is, uh, you have well, okay, then I have one question for Ms. Light and, and, and Baudet. Can you move your question to the next block, please? Because otherwise I run into troubles. Yeah? Okay. Ms. Van Rooij, a small, a short follow-up, and then we move to the next block, and then you are the first two questioners of the next block. Mr. Van Rooij.
Draghi, you spoke about negative side effects. Um, th these are negative to our view. Um, you mentioned also that the, not only uh, liabilities increased because of the lower interest rate, but also that assets increased. But the figures show that the increase of liability is far much higher than the increase of assets. Could you react on that? No, I said, I said not only said that, I, I clearly agree with this. And I also said that, uh, in fact, low rates diminish the returns on investments. So there's no question about the fact that low rates are not good for pension funds, pension funds that offer guaranteed benefits, of course. Of course. But having said that, at the same time, low rates are necessary for the recovery and for employment. I don't think pension funds, generally speaking, would benefit from a prolonged recession. So we have to basically um, compare short-term negative consequences with long-term positive effects and be confident that with the recovery, interest rates will also go up and return on investments will go up and the value, the present value of liabilities will also decrease. Thank you. So now we move to uh, the next uh, block, which will be about, well, we discussed it already a little bit, but the effects, unwanted side effects and risks of the monetary policy of the ECB. And this, for this block, I give the floor to uh, Mr. Harbers, Mr. Van Weyenberg, and Mr. Snells. Mr. Harbers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Draghi, for uh, visiting our parliament uh, today. Uh, we appreciate very much that although the ECB is an independent institution, um, we can have this opportunity to, to uh, discuss uh, our questions uh, today with, uh, with you. And I would like to start this block about the side effects with uh, two questions. Um, uh, the first is, um, yeah, you already spoke about some of the side effects, for instance, uh, on pension funds and, and households. But can you also give your view about um, the question of wrong allocation of capital? Um, uh, for instance, uh, the risk that uh, companies, especially small uh, SME uh, companies, um, uh, have access to um, uh, uh, capital at very low interest uh, rates. And that might uh, uh, lead to the risk that they uh, will lose competitiveness. For instance, that, company that companies that are at the end of their competitiveness um, will live longer because they still have access to, uh, uh, to capital. That's, that's uh, the first uh, question. And the second is um, the effects for our national uh, uh, central bank, the Dutch uh, national central bank. Um, the debt of uh, DMB has increased with uh, 70%. And when the interest rates will rise again, uh, the risk occurs that our national central bank has to sell a part of the debt with, uh, uh, with a loss. And in order to eliminate this risk, uh, DMB and also the Bundesbank reserve money for the moment when the QE program will stop and the interest rates uh, will rise. Um, can you tell us what is the general ECB policy for national banks to deal with these uh, risks? And how can it be avoided that debts have to be sold with uh, a loss in, uh, in the future? And are other member states doing the same? Because if they don't, uh, we fear the risk that um, the governments of these uh, countries will have to pay again. Mr. Draghi. Thank you. Well, let me First of all, we talked about the negative effects uh, uh, of low interest rates uh, before, but in fact, low interest rates have positive effects on all those people who have mortgages, on entrepreneurs, on everybody who borrows money. So we have to look at every side of the, of the reality. And, um, and as you said, by and large, low interest rates have been uh, essential for promoting the recovery. And here it comes to the specific answer to your question. Um, I, I mean, I wish we had uh, such subtle instrument of analysis to assess exactly whether a company is structurally viable or not. In other words, each time you lower interest rates, you have companies that uh, were not able to get credit at a higher rate, now they get credit at a lower rate. But uh, does that mean that they are structurally non-viable? Or it may mean other things. We, 
frankly don't know. We don't have these instruments to know exactly whether a corporate buyer or an SME is actually structurally viable or not. What we know is a different thing. We know that following the, uh, the low rates, following the uh, QE, following our monetary policy, the economy of the euro area now is growing strongly. Which me and and important thing, this growth has been going on now for quite a while, since 2013 until now. So it's almost it's four years, about four years. Uh, growth averaged 0.4, 0.5 each and every quarter. So it means that comp by by and large, the majority of the company was structurally viable. They borrowed money when they needed. They borrowed money. Some of them were possibly in a liquidity crisis, but by and large, they continue to produce. And they increase the economy's output. So if there are these structurally unviable companies that have profited from these lower rates, they were not the majority, certainly, because otherwise we would not have seen such an increase in output. Now, coming to your second question, now, our monetary policy doesn't have as a scope the uh, profits of the national central banks. So our policy is geared to uh, the objective of price stability. But having said that, we estimate the overall asset purchase program is actually creating profits for national central banks, not losses. There is one case where uh, central banks have to purchase bonds at negative rates and that could uh, cause losses. However, the maturities they are buying into are very short, so the book uh, losses are going to be small. The program is very modest in its essence, and it's going to be undertaken only, with necessary, uh, only when it's necessary. So we've been very, very cautious in allowing for purchases below the deposit facility rate. Thank you. And, and one question, because we, uh, in our National Central Bank, made reservations for possible future losses, and the Bundesbank did so, but is that a general policy for, for uh, na national central banks in every country? Um, and if not, what are the chances that these central banks and their countries will encounter problems uh, when interest rates are rising again, for the, especially for their government finances? All, all central banks that I know of are actually booking provisions for future losses. So I, I, don't, expect, uh, I don't expect disasters there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, welcome, Mr. Dwagi. Um, the unconventional monetary policy of the ECB was meant to prevent uh, the European economy from falling in a protracted crisis of, uh, of deflation. Unconventional economic circumstances you mentioned uh, in your introduction. Let me take the opportunity to say that I think that you were right in this environment with a lot of critical questions. However, I have some questions about the nearby future now that you're coming in a period that you have to deliberate on, uh, on tightening monetary policy. Uh, and I have some questions about the arguments that are playing a role in those deliberations. Um, for example, uh, uh, are you looking at budgetary policies of national governments? Are you looking at uh, 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 other forms of policy, uh, uh, reform policies of, of uh, national uh, uh, governments, and are they playing a role? Do you see speci uh, specific risks in this period that you have to, uh, uh, lose, uh, to tighten monetary policies? And what kind of risks are there? Uh, and final question, um, uh, what are the risks of in, co in continuing uh, uh, the loose monetary policy of the ECB, while at the same time the Fed is slowly raising uh, interest rates? Um, so can you? Elaborate. Thank you. Well, the, <clears throat> our monetary policy was, uh, had been designed with the objective of price stability when uh, price stability was at serious risk in 2013 and 14 of, um, 
of a, a deflation and will be designed with price stability in mind when this risk now that it's by and large gone will be designed, designed with price stability in mind also on, on the way out of the present situation. So that is the uh, only criterion that we have in mind. If countries, that's why countries uh, have to consolidate their, their budgets, have to undertake the needed structural reforms, and, uh, and whether they had it or not, uh, it's not a relevant consideration in uh, our strategies, not in, in both directions, really, in both directions. We, when we look at today's situation, we see that uh, uh, what we call the balance of risk for growth has uh, definitely improved. The balance, the, 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 we, we said for several, for several months that the risks were tilted on the downside, but the composition of risks has changed. Originally, it was, uh, it was mostly domestic risks that we were concerned about. And then uh, it became more of a sort of external risk component, like geopolitical risks. Uh, but also on that front, uh, we, we, we see, and we hope we will continue to do so, that the, one of these risks was the threat of protectionism, has receded. Another risk was a less, a, a less uh, brilliant performance of emerging market economies. Now we see that world growth uh, is actually stronger than expected. So the balance of risk for growth has improved. What does it mean um, as far as our objective is concerned, namely inflation? Well, the inflation situation is by and large what, uh, what it was before. So we haven't seen a convincing sign of yet of an upward, uh, an upward um, movement in underlying inflation. We don't see yet convincing sign that this convergence is, towards a dura is durable and is self-sustained. But certainly some of our elements of our forward guidance are meant to address the tail risks of inflation, of inflation uh, behavior. And to the extent that the balance of risk for growth gradually improves, also the probability of these tail risks become less and less. Thank you. But you are, you are looking uh, at what uh, other central banks are doing and what their, uh, their policies uh, are. Does it mean anything for the ECB when the Fed is slowly raising interest rates? Or are you just looking at uh, the different inflation me uh, measures? We uh, are, res all central banks are responsible to their national mandate. And likewise, we are responsible for price stability in the euro area. So that's what we are looking, that's what we are bound by. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much for this opportunity for this uh, exchange of views, uh, of course, respecting each other's uh, respective responsibilities and the, uh, to, for my party, much valued independence of the, both the European and the Dutch Central Bank. Um, I would also like to, 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 to look ahead a bit. Um, we've seen that, that the unconventional monetary policy uh, took the ECB in uncharted waters. And I think, like, like Mr. Snell said, it has, it has shown us that the effect has been in a return, a prevent of a meltdown of the economy and a return of, uh, of economic stability and also uh, improved uh, growth conditions. At the same time, there's one thing maybe even more difficult of sailing into uncharted waters, and that's actually sailing out of it again. So, so could you maybe elaborate on the risk you see there? And also the fact that if you keep sailing in uncharted waters too long, there's no place left to go if there would be a new crisis asking for unconventional policy once more. We all hope we're not going to get there in the foreseeable future, but none of us has a magic glass to look into the future. Could you elaborate on that, maybe? Thank you. Um, well, thank you also for agreeing that our monetary policy prevented the meltdown of the euro area economy and um, prevent the materialization of deflationary risks. Um, 
our monetary policy was successful. Now the issue is, uh, is it time to uh, exit or think, or is it time of thinking about exit or not? Well, the assessment of the governing council is that uh, this time hasn't come yet. We aren't there yet. We had improvements, solid improvements in growth. We had, as I just said, we had um, the balance of risk for growth that continues to improve. Um, and, uh, and certainly this has implications for the probability that certain tail risk events, as far as inflation is concerned, will, uh, will, uh, will materialize. Uh, but we aren't there yet, because when we look at our yardstick, namely inflation, we see that uh, this doesn't satisfy those criteria that I was mentioning in my introductory statement, namely that we are moving towards uh, an inflation rate which is close but below 2% over the medium term. So it's not only touch and go, but it should be a durable convergence, that it's also self-sustained. In other words, when we start, when we start talking about exiting the present strategy or monetary policy, we must be sure that the inflation rate after we have exited or after we have uh, changed our monetary policy will stay there, will not go down. And, uh, and we are not there yet. And one of the main reasons is that the underlying inflation, is, by the way, uh, our inflation objective still is headline inflation. But we have also to look at a variety of indicators, one of which is the underlying inflation, doesn't show any convincing sign to uh, go back to, uh, to the historical average or to, our, or to our objective. Why isn't actually showing any sign? And one of the main reasons there is the uh, very subdued behavior of nominal wages. Uh, we observe all across the euro area some movement in nominal wage, some upward movement, but still quite, uh, quite limited. And uh, the reasons for that basically are that the, as the ECB bulletin, by the way, today has shown in a, in a new, in new piece of research, is that in fact the labor market's lack that is there, it's big, it's still there, it's obviously it's improved a lot but it's still, it's still uh, present. And, um, and also, but the other factors make, you, make one more confident. For example, the labor market reforms that have taken place in some countries have now taken place quite some time ago. So their, F, their depressing effect on wages should be, should be through, should be finished. And at the same time, productivity uh, is actually going up. And now the Netherlands, again, is a case in point where productivity, labor productivity is actually high. So we are, uh, on one hand, we observe a labor market's lack with certain, with certain concern persisting. And on the other, we are confident that uh, we should see signs of uh, increase in nominal wages relatively, relatively soon. Yes, thank you. I see signs of a maybe changing attitude in the foreseeable future, but I'm, 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 I'm aware that there are different places than this meeting for you to communicate them. Um, uh, and I would totally agree on, on, the, on the call also on labor unions and, uh, and the employers' organizations to look at the increase of, uh, of wages, a matter of discussions in the Netherlands as well. Um, maybe if I, if I could ask one, one second and a slightly different question, I think uh, notwithstanding the exact moment of the uh, the ending of the phasing out of the of the current uh, very loose financial of monetary policy, I think it's clear that we will be in a very low interest rate environment after the ending of the the present monetary policy stance. Um, and uh, you, you 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 touched upon that in your introductory statement, uh, discussing uh, aging, but I think also technological uh, uh, developments. Would you say that that there is more necessary to make the, our European economies low interest rate proof, and is there a specific role there for the ECB in uh, promoting that? There is a case for the... For actually promoting, making European economies more low interest rate proof, more resilient to the probably longer term low interest rates, even after the ending of the uh, QE policy or uh, the negative interest rates. 
Yeah, well, first of all, let me add on nominal wages that, of course, wages are, wage determination is in the hands of the social partners. We are not uh, suggesting anything, but, but for one thing, the nominal wages movements are the strongest uh, factor for reassuring that increase in inflation is going to be durable. Um, the, it's true, interest rates will stay low, but there's something, I think I said it before, even, our sh even if our short-term interest rates will stay low, that doesn't mean that the interest rates on different maturities will also stay low. In fact, they've already gone up. And uh, so this will be, will, be, will be more and more visible as the recovery will establish itself and as we will see the first sign of a convincing upward movement in the underlying rate of inflation. Thank you. I would now like to open the floor for other questions. I already have uh, to start with uh, Mrs. Leighton, Mr. Baudet and Mr. Nijboer. One of the goals of the European Union is to create a functional market economy. And if we reflect on the CP, CSPP program, uh, in which the European Central Bank buys corporate bonds from multinationals, from in the Netherlands, for example, Achmea, ASML, Heineken, Shell, GasUnie, enormous rich companies who do, who doesn't need this money, uh, but you even buy, um, you even uh, uh, support with the program Swiss countries like Glencore. And I would like your reflection on this, on how these kind of pri privileges for multinationals sustain, uh, opposed to small uh, and, and medium corporations who hasn't access to this uh, uh, program, how this policy uh, sustain the level playing field and a very functional market economy? In fact, in fact, uh, our policies do support market economy. Um, in in uh, our our corporate bond program is designed with, again, like everything else we do, with a price stability objective in mind. Therefore, it is uh, oriented and designed to create monetary expansion that would support our price stability objective. Now, is it true that only supports large companies and not the small companies? Now, let, let me observe that uh, the, since the launching of our, of our program, the issuance of uh, corporate bond issuance has increased markedly, so everybody issues more. The funding costs have gone down, and the SMEs do benefit from these lower funding costs. But what is even more important, the fact that many corporates now use the market to finance themselves means that they use the banks much less to finance themselves. And therefore, they have opened up space in the bank's balance sheets for them to lend more money to the SMEs. In fact, in all our bank lending survey, we are, especially the last one, we are observing that SMEs uh, uh, report to us that uh, finding credit at uh, uh, reasonable interest rates is not a problem. Let's not forget that uh, two years ago, until two years ago, SMEs were reporting that credit, finding credit, was the second most difficult uh, problem they had in running their business after finding clients. Now, both of them have disappeared from being a problem for SMEs. Your statement that uh, small and medium enterprises can get their credits from banks uh, is something I don't, don't really see in our real economy. They complaining that they don't get these credits they want to. But I was talking about the S, uh, CSPP program where there is corporate bonds of multinationals are bought. 
and not of these SMEs, small and medium enterprises. They cannot enter this program. We asked our government a list of corporations, multinationals, who benefit from your program. There's none small or medium enterprise on it. Only multinationals. And I was asking you about the level playing field and the market, the, function, the functional market economy. Is it inflation rates, whatever it takes? Is it price stability, whatever it takes? Or is it also a little bit of market economy within the program of the European Union? It's the market economy. Our, our programs do have price stability in mind, but uh, they're not, uh, they not meant to distort the economy or the pricing or the interest rates or the spreads. Now, in fact, we see that uh, spreads and interest rates are not very far from uh, historical fundamentals values. Now, in general, we have our survey with the, with, now the survey is for the, admittedly, it's not for the Netherlands only, it's for the whole of the Eurozone. And the small, uh, the SAFI serve, so-called survey on the access to financial of enterprises, reveals that uh, that SMEs don't actually are not credit constrained, and in fact they the, they find from banks the credit they need. So the other thing is why aren't SMEs in the program? That was your question. Now, SMEs may not be in the program, first of all, because they're not the typical corporate bond issuer. Usually, the ones who issue bonds are large companies. That's one. one. The second point is that our program is also designed with risk management considerations in mind. And so it was uh, designed uh, with the view to uh, kind of contain the risks that uh, any program that buys uh, corporate bonds would naturally entail. But as I said, the, the SMEs in general in the Eurozone don't seem to be constrained. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Bourdain. Mr. Draghi, um, you've explained uh, quite convincingly, I think, the necessity of your QE program uh, to uh, maintain the Euro currency if with such unnatural countries forming together a, a single currency, uh, one, one needs to take uh, remarkable measures. And uh, of course, this has come at, uh, at great cost for the Netherlands, our pension savings, our, uh, our businesses, our savings in general, our economic growth. Uh, and this is why in the Netherlands now we have an increasing uh, number of people doubting whether we should continue staying in the euro zone. And this is um, what brings me to my question. You've said in January um, that any country leaving the Eurozone must settle the bill first uh, regarding Italy's uh, you know, possibilities of leaving the Eurozone. As we and the Netherlands now have a surplus in the Target 2 system of uh, around 100 billion euro, does this, by your own words, mean that if the Netherlands decides to leave the Eurozone, which is one of the key points of my party's program, uh, we would get back 100 million euro from the southern countries in the Eurozone, according to your views. Mr. Draghi. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me respond to you as I have responded to similar questions in the European Parliament. Uh, the euro is irrevocable, and this is the treaty. I will not speculate on uh, hypotheses that have no ground in the present treaty. Second, the euro has been a success for the eurozone and for especially for countries like the Netherlands. As I mentioned before, you had uh, an economic situation, thanks, I should say, first and foremost, to your strength, to the way you to the to the quality of your laws to the fact that your business environment is growth friendly to your own merits but also to the support of our monetary policy you had an economic situation which was rarely so good but also there is a deeper reason and there is a deeper reason why the euro has benefited all countries but especially countries that are strong 
export-oriented, with high productivity, and a business-favorable legal environment. The euro has protected the single market. Most of you are too young to remember the 80s and the early 90s, when we had periodic devaluations of all countries. And there was a strong instability there. Neither price stability was there, nor the better countries, which were stronger, could actually see their merit rewarded, because there were continuing devaluations robbing them from their, from their merit. Now, the single market was a major achievement towards our integration, but it was also an achievement that has increased our prosperity, our collective prosperity. And the single market cannot be protected other than with one currency, with irrevocably fixed exchange rates. And that's why the euro came into consideration in the early 90s and was finally found its place in the Maastricht Treaty. So I think we, if we remember the experience of those years, we should have no doubts about the euro being a success. And, um, and also legally, I made the point before. Thank you. Well, clearly, we, we can disagree about the merits of the euro uh, currency, and uh, my view is that in non-euro countries, the uh, economic situation is significantly better. But um, just one point. You said you didn't want to speculate about the possibility of the eurozone falling apart, but isn't that precisely what you did in January when you were saying, if Italy leaves, it will have to settle the bill? You were actually speculating about the breaking apart of the eurozone, and wouldn't it be intellectually fair to have the same uh, principles if the Netherlands decides to leave? I, um, in the European Parliament, I was asked the same question about that. I said one can have technical answers of all kinds, but the point is the euro is irrevocable, and I'm not going to speculate on hypotheses that have no ground whatsoever. We'll see about that then. We'll see about that, for sure. Next question is for Mr. Nybuer. Mr. Draghi, thank you for the opportunity to discuss ECB's uh, monetary policy, which is, and in my opinion, should also be the domain of the ECB. Nevertheless, uh, national policymakers have to adapt to the consequences of uh, this monetary policy. And we dis discussed already the wages. Uh, your colleague Klaas Knot from the Dutch Central Bank pledges already for wage increases in the Netherlands for a couple of years now. But there are also two other uh, things I want to mention. For example, the steep rising housing prices in our biggest cities and the all-time highs on the stock markets. I have two questions about that. My first question is, what is your assessment of these risks and how will it affect financial stability? And my second question is, what could we as policymakers do to mitigate these risks, especially on the housing markets and uh, with respect to the regulation of banks? Personally, I'm, on a, I'm a strong proponent of an increase in the leverage ratio for banks from 3 on the European level to 10 percent. I think that will help, but I, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> very curious about your opinion. Question and answer in one. <laughs> Mr. Draghi. Thank you. There have been uh, price increases in the housing sector in various countries in the large cities. But when we consider the average house price increases at, at large, we don't see it yet a uh, sign of stretched uh, valuations. Let me also add that in some cases, these house prices were coming from periods of prolonged stagnation. So that is something to, uh, to look at. The, but when we move to financial stability and we ask ourselves the question, are these increases threatening the financial stability of the euro area? Well, we should also ask another question. Are these increases accompanied by an increase in debt? And that's where we don't see evidence. We see that, uh, we see that basically credit uh, uh, remains relatively subdued uh, we don't see a, a significant increase in leverage. Um, so 
by and large, we don't see the other side of what would be a worry for financial stability. Uh, having said that, however, there, are, there, are, there is a specific condition in the Netherlands where household indebtedness is actually high. And, um, and so the case for prudential measures in that sector, in the housing sector, is there. And that's why the ESRB had issued a warning. Now, is the monetary policy the right tool for addressing this issue? Um, well, the answer is no, because it's a local price increases of uh, a certain sector in a certain country, in a certain region of this country, namely the large cities uh, in not only in the Netherlands, by the way, yeah? also in other countries, we, we, see, we see the same phenomenon. Therefore, it's not so much monetary policy that should be used, but it's what we call macroprudential tools. And national authorities have started moving their uh, prudential tools in a dialogue with the, with the ECB as well. As you know, the ECB has the power to top up, to add to the national uh, government's measures. Uh, we certainly uh, are in favor of uh, a loan-to-value ratio of something that would go beyond 100%. Uh, so we are in favor of a, of, a, of a careful monitoring of this situation and the undertaking, the introduction, the application of uh, macroprudential measures where needed. Thank you for this answer. I have one question about uh, the healthiness of the European banks, the banking system. Uh, I totally agree that it's, it should be macro, macro prudential or national policies that should improve these banks and not monetary policy. But when we see the non-performing loans in the southern part of Europe, and we see the leverage ratios in some of the northern countries, also the Netherlands, uh, there could be a case that the European Central Bank says, uh, because of, or on behalf of the financial stability, it should be wise that policymakers take steps in the direction to increase the leverage ratio to decrease the non-performing loans. Well, when we look at the um, banking system in the euro area, we should admit that over the last three, four years, there have been significant progress. Uh, especially as far as solvency of the banks is concerned. The capital ratios of all banks today stand well above what they were three or four years ago. So a substantial effort has been made in raising, in raising capital. However, when we move, the issue is not so much now today solvency, but profitability. The leverage ratio that uh, banks have today of course, in the aggregate, I'm not uh, discussing individual banks' uh, situation is, is adequate. We have to close now the Basel III uh, review process. And um, so we don't, we don't uh, it's not that the main issue. The main issue is profitability. Profitability is, um, is low, both because business models are, uh, have to be updated, introducing digitalization. Business models that are still branch-based with a very large uh, personnel component have, been, have become very costly. The cost-income ratios in some countries and some banks are way high than what's uh, sustainable today, way higher. And in some countries, of course, you have the legacy of non-performing loans, which is uh, a, a weight on their profitability and on their capacity, on the banks, on these banks' capacity to actually give credit. And there the issue is uh, namely to create an environment where these loans can be disposed of, can be sold, can be taken out of the balance sheet. And this has to be done via a market process. 
So there are many ideas there. That people talk about bad banks, the creation of bad banks, and we can discuss this, of course. But the, the key thing, in my view, is not the creation of a, of a, of a bad bank or a box that could uh, quickly accelerate the disposal of the MPLs. It certainly it could be helpful. But the key thing there is to create an environment where these loans can be priced and sold. And that is important. Now, um, in, in some countries, you had this accumulation of uh, non-performing loans because of the crisis, of course, but also because the legal environment is one where these loans cannot be priced and sold. And uh, uh, legisla legislative improvements have been made, but somehow they addressed only the future loans, the future NPLs, when the, prog the problem is a legacy problem. So they should have addressed the past NPLs as well. I think that's the main thing. And for that, one needs changes, certainly changes in the bank's governance structure, in the risk management, in the debt recovery procedures, but also, also convincing legislative improvements where a market for MPL that is transparent can actually take place. By the way, all countries that had such markets have eliminated any, the NPL problem. So experience of the others should teach something. Thank you. Thank you. Last question is for, of this block is for Mr. Van Rooyen. I ask you, is there only one question, no follow-up, because then we move to the next block. Mr. Van Rooyen. Thank you. I would like to refer to an article which appeared in uh, Investments and Pensions Europe, IPE, and which is titled, ECB's policy could cause Dutch pension system implosion. The article clearly mentions our 50-plus initiative draft law as a possible solution. We propose to create a temporary risk-free rate of, with a, of a bottom of 2%, just for as long as the ECB continues with the QE policy with a maximum of five years. My question is, what do you think of this proposal of our party, which allows a temporary lower rate? Is it a legitimate measure for the Netherlands? Is a 2% bottom rate reasonable? And finally, um, the consequence of the present situation is that the purchase power for pensioners is already uh, without any indexation for the past 10 years, leading to a strong uh, decrease of power, purchase power. You spoke about short-term negative effects, but what do you think if it's already 10 years of no indexation with a expectation that it might be another five years of no, if, uh, no indexation and either cuts in pension payments? Mr. Rahe. Thank you. Well, let me say something I haven't said so far. I mean, pension funds regulation and supervision don't fall under the preview, the remit of the, of the European Central Bank. So it's not, uh, it's not up to us to comment on the structural reforms of the Dutch pension funds. So the, that's, let me preface this because it's, um, it's essential. Um, having said that, I can only restate that our monetary policy has price stability objective in mind. And uh, we are aware of the other effects on, on pension funds. Low interest rates are a problem for pension funds, where, as we said before, the negative consequences are more than the positive ones in the short term. But also, since negative interest rates or low interest rates are the prerequisite for recovery in the medium and long term, we will see that the pension funds will benefit from the recovery and certainly have been protected from the deflation and from the recession. So the, I would stop here. I would stop here with the, with other than giving a sense of, together with an appeal to patience, also a sense of confidence that uh, the situation is improving, is much better than it was three years ago, is, it continues to improve, and with improvements, also the problems of the pension funds will be resolved. Okay, okay. then we move to the next block. Thank you. Uh, the next block is prepared by uh, Mrs. Leiten and Mr. Omtzigt, and it is about the institutional position and mandate of the European Central Bank. 
thank you. And um, thanks for the answers so far. And I'm very interested to hear that you want shorter balance sheets in the Netherlands. And that comment comes from the institution with the largest balance sheet within the whole Eurozone. In its ruling on the OMT program, the European Court of Justice has confirmed that the um, article which forbids monetary finance would de facto be violated if actions taken by the European Central Bank led to the indirect monetary financing. Put it differently, it is not only the letter of the statutes, but also the spirit of the statutes the ESCB has to adhere to. The court decided that such purchases may not be used to circumvent the objective of prohibiting the monetary financing of member states. Thus, when the ECB purchases government bonds on secondary markets, sufficient safeguards must be built into the intervention to ensure that the latter does not contravene the prohibition of monetary financing. The court was satisfied in the OMT case. It was satisfied because the ECB said that it would refrain from making any prior announcement concerning either its decisions to carry out such purchases or the volume it would purchase. But what happened in QE? The ECB announced exactly how much bonds would be bought each month and that purchases will last until December 2017 and maybe even after. Moreover, the European Central Bank has no intention to ever sell the bonds it already has bought and will buy in the future, having a stack of 2,500 billion euros on the balance sheet. The governing council of the bank has decided that sales are not expected to be normal practice in the foreseeable future. So if we put the QE program along the lines of the court decision, because we're trying to keep you exactly to your mandate, it seems that QE constitutes de facto monetary financing. Do you see that differently? Or do you agree it's monetary financing? And do you have um, convincing legal advice that what you do is within the limits given by the mandate, Article 123 of the Article of the Functioning of the, um, uh, of the Market. Thank you. Um, let me give you two, first two short answers to your last questions. First of all, uh, it's not monetary financing, so I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. And second, we have uh, all the legal advice uh, we need to uh, prove ourselves and the rest of the Eurozone that that's not the case that is not monetary financing. First of all, we, QE is in place for the objective of price stability. Second, the treaty and the statute of the ECB basically give the ECB discretion on which instruments to use in order to pursue price stability. This. Uh, treaty and statute provision was confirmed by the ECJ in its pronouncement on the OMT, where the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, said that the ECB has, if I'm not mistaken, broad discretion in the use of its instruments. Fourth, the ECB, in deciding the QE, as well as uh, the time when we announced the OMT, had all precautions so as to make sure that we don't do monetary financing. Namely, we buy on the secondary market. We have issue and issuer's limits. So there is no case here. And, um, and that's it. Well, you say you only buy the secondary market, but you already announced what you buy the secondary market with a time lag of two weeks when these um, um, bonds are emitted. So the traders at the primary market know that after two weeks, they can come and sell them at your doorstep of the European Central Bank. That's circumventing um, the um, prohibition on doing it on the primary market. Second, you say you have a limit on the issue that's why I asked my first question. The limit first was 25%, then it became 33%. And, well, the limit could also be 100%. Well, you couldn't go much beyond 100% of the outstanding debt because then you would sort of buy something which doesn't exist anymore unless you try some uh, derivatives. So you're going every time a step further 
away from a functioning market economy, taking huge risk. I mean, the Euro Dutch central banks took three billion already in a provision for if things go wrong, for instance, if interest rate rise. And you still believe that this is fully within the, um, the framework which you have and that you still are not doing any monetary financing, even though you've bought 2,500 billion euro of government debt um, by the end of the year? Yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, we do. I think we believe that our precautions have been, uh, have been put in place exactly to avoid this uh, danger. That the issue limit has been moved upward, but still consistent with uh, what the collective action clauses in bonds foresee. So it's, and it's not been moved since then. It's not been moved since then. But still, uh, the, uh, I would recall what the European Court of Justice has said giving broad discretion to the ECB in what instruments to use in order to pursue price stability. Thank you. Well, but I mean, on the last part, you say, um, indeed, you have the collective action clause. If you have more than 33%, you can indeed block restructuring of, for instance, the government debt um, if it needs to. So if Italy needs to restructure and you hold 34%, you would have the very unfortunate position that the ECB could block the restructuring because it would lose uh, or want to do the restructuring and you're a political actor. But even if you have 32%, then you just need one other relatively small actor, and you still have a veto power, and you're an enormous political player in a necessary restructuring if the case comes up. How do you mitigate that problem if this case becomes true, because the levels of debt are still rising in part of the Eurozone, and if such a case uh, comes up, will you then look at the interests of the Eurozone, or at the interest of the balance sheet of the European system of central banks? Thank you. Sorry for repeating, but we look at price stability, number one. Second, we have our mandate. Third, we have the treaty that says that we don't do monetary financing. Fourth, we are sure that the precautions we put in place are enough to avoid this risk. It doesn't seem like you want to answer my colleague, Omtzigt. No, I've answered. Absolutely. Yes. But he was concerning the risk, whether you hit the, the percentage which he was talking I, about. You want me to say what we would do in case certain unrealistic hypotheses were to take place. I'm not going to say that. We don't want to speculate on things that have no probability of happening. Sorry? Period. Yes, sorry, yes. You say there is no probability that any, at any point in the future any of the national debts of the Eurozone countries has to be restructured? That's a zero probability event? No, no. We, we said no, no. I don't know about that. I don't want to speculate on that. We, we have decided the 33% limit. It's enough for the collective action clauses, and that's period. We are not going to speculate on the fact that if there is one that has 1%, we could do this and that. That's, frankly, speculation in which I don't think it would be right for us to spend time. But is it also speculation that one of the countries of the Eurozone at some point will need restructuring and that a large amount of debt stays within the European system of central banks for which the European taxpayers will foot the bill at the very end? So far, the taxpayer hasn't foot any bill. So this also, we, should, we may discuss this about the dangers of something that might happen. So far, what I see as a reality is that our monetary policy has supported the recovery in the Eurozone, has created four and a half million jobs which were not available before. That's what I see so far. That's the reality. The rest is speculation. Okay, so you don't want to um, speculate about things that could happen. <laughs> Clear. Let's concern 
something else that is uh, a subject uh, when it concerns a mandate, and that's transparency. Uh, the ECB programs concern a lot of money, and there is a lot of discussion about it, and there is a lack of transparency. Um, a lack of proper accountability mechanisms to see what you do, why you do it, and based on which context you have. Are you prepared to publish your own agenda in order we can see with whom or which banks or corporations you spoke? Are you prepared to wordly um, uh, uh, reveal the minutes of general meetings? And furthermore, do you agree that, there, that we need more information about the European banks to be published, for example, about the stress tests and the sanity of individual banks? After this question, we open the floor for the other questions. And for that, I have Van Dijk, Van Raan and Van Rooyen. So, but first we have to answer on this question. <coughs> We, we think that um, <clears throat> transparency and accountability are indeed uh, essential. They are the natural complement of our independence. So I completely agree with you that we should do our best to improve transparency. And in fact, we've done significant, very significant progress in uh, the last few years on this front as uh, the recent uh, assessment by the NGO Transparency International would acknowledge. Now, you're asking me where I publish. No, I'll come to this if you want. Uh, you're asking me about uh, publish my agenda. I do publish my agenda. Why are you asking that? You're asking whether we publish the account of our meetings. We do publish them. Why are you why are asking them? Well, worldly. What does it mean, worldly? Oh. No, it was decided to do the accounts, not the, not the minutes, like other central banks do, by the way. And then what else the, uh, did you ask me about um, oh, the SSM? On the, S the SSM is, very, is already very transparent. If things can be improved, we'll certainly do it. But I think this should, you should ask, thanks to the separation principle, I think you should ask this to Madame Nouy. Thank you. Okay, I have questions from, first, first of all, Mr. Van Dijk. Uh, by the way, everybody, one question, no follow-up, if I want to give you all a chance. Van Dijk. Yeah, I was, uh, thank you. I was wondering, uh, because you were a little irritated about... Uh, no. About... <laughs> about what? About the amount of money, the risk you take by putting 2,500 billion at the end of the year buying, purchasing bonds, and that's 25% of the total debt of the, of the Euro countries. So you already have 25% of all the debt of the 19 Euro countries on your balance sheet. That is risky. And I think that, and a lot of with me, and the problem is, how many countries are all now on the limit of 33%? I read the Portuguese is almost 33%, the Irish are always 33% at the end of the year, the Netherlands, Finland. So you are getting to the limit of what you can purchase. And when you touch that Question limit... Question clear, how many countries? Yeah, and when you touch that limit, how is the, the balance then, when you cannot buy anything from Holland, but you can buy a lot from Italy still. We are bound by rules, and we intend to stick with them. And we're also confident that our program will run smoothly. I'll stop at this. There is no other way I can respond to your question about no, risk. But, but, but I think you will get Other than reassuring you, that the rules are going to be respected. Okay, but I'm oh, sorry, sir, Mr. Like, uh, I said the rules. Uh, for, the sorry, it's clear. It, 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 sorry, How I have to give the, are you? the next question is for Mr. Van Raan. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Draghi, you look uh, remarkably calm for a man who uh, issues uh, uh, 2.5 trillion out of uh, thin air, so to speak. 
uh, especially with your chief economist saying there's no plan B, as he stated uh, publicly. Uh, but that is not my question. My question is, um, in the first block, you said there were some ecological filters in place to decide. Uh, could you name, say, three of those filters? I'm sorry. Ecological or uh, animal welfare uh, filters to decide whether to buy bonds uh, from certain companies. You said they were in place. Um, maybe I misunderstood, but perhaps you could name a few. Thank you. Now, it, it, just one word about the size of our QE. In terms of purchase of public debt, our size is comparable with what is being done in the United States, less than Japan, comparable with the United Kingdom. So, no, again, no, uh, no uniqueness to our monetary policy. On, oh, no, I'm sorry, there must be a misunderstanding. There was no filter. Yeah. We're only, yeah. sorry? You meant filters on the types of criteria. bonds, types of corporate bonds, so on the different sectors criteria, whether it was sustainable. No, we, we buy also green assets, but as you said, Today, the non-green component is dominant in our purchases because we buy with a program designed for monetary policy and risk management considerations and level playing field for all the corporates. Are you asking that? Or, sorry. So, so for the purpose of clarification, so there, there are no ecological filters or criteria? No. Okay. Not now. The only thing we say is that we also buy the rest. Okay. Thank you. Thank Next you. question is for Ms. Schouten. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the, let's say, the, the, the long term. Um, about half a year ago, uh, Klaas Knot, uh, our executive director of the Nederlandse Bank, uh, he emphasized in, the, um, in one of the Dutch newspapers that, um, that the countries in the Eurozone, um, uh, instead of what we maybe thought, more and more diverge instead of converge. And he said, more diverge instead of converge, that they, that they uh, not come closer, let's say that. Um, and he said it becomes more and more difficult to have one um, monetary policy for the whole Eurozone. Do you agree with that? Well, again, a reality shows that the outcome has been different. We, we have an index which measures the growth in value added in each country which is a proxy for growth in GDP. And then we calculate the dispersion of this index. In other words, how much these growth rates diverge across countries. So now we are at the same level as we were in 1997. So it means broad convergence in the Euro area countries. Clearly, during the crisis, there were huge divergences divergences in rates, in credit, and in growth rates and employment rates. If we have to see, uh, if we have to look now at the situation, it has improved on that account as well. So that is, that is a, a good, very good news also for another reason. Convergence, in, in, in our view, convergence and trust are the two pillars on which the Eurozone is uh, founded. And, um, and so any improvement we have on that ground. Now, of course, we have to have another type of convergence, which was the one we were discussing before, convergence as far as structural reforms are concerned. And that's the other part, which will have to be addressed more and more strongly in the future. Next question is for Mr. Harbers. And Mr. Van Rooyen. Mr. Draghi, I would like to raise a, a totally different question. The relation between the ECB policy and the FED policy. I have the, the following questions. How could the FED pass to policy normalization and the subsequent rise in U.S. interest rates affect the Eurozone interest rates and the ECB pass to policy normalization? Should we expect the ECB to counter unwanted effects of major U.S. monetary policy adjustments would higher U.S. interest rates make it easier for the ECB to raise interest as well? Thank you. Let me first make two considerations. The first is that each central bank is bound by its national mandate. In our case, the, the mandate is price stability for the whole of the euro area. And the uh, second consideration is that the two central banks are in uh, 
parts of the world that are in a different stage of the recovery cycle, being the United States more advanced than we are. The, the third consideration is, of course, that we, we look at the overall set of financing conditions. And as uh, to the extent that these financing conditions can be changed by other factors, one of which could be other countries' interest rates, we'll have to take this into account into our assessment. But for us, the key point remains a durable, self-sustained convergence of the inflation towards our objective of a rate which is close but below 2%. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Baudet. Yes, Mr. Draghi, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has researched 69 monetary unions that were dissolved since the end of the Second World War. It found that remarkably little macroeconomic volatility uh, happened around the time of currency union dissolutions. I'm sure they were all irrevocable until the moment they turned out not to be. Uh, Moreover, throughout history, we haven't seen a single instance of monetary union that didn't necessitate, over time, political union. If you believe the euro is here to stay, if you support, still support the single currency in Europe, does this imply that you are a supporter and perhaps believe it's necessary for the eurozone to develop into a political union, a full political union, over time? Thank you. Well, first of all, let me just uh, remind ourselves about uh, the, uh, what we call the Eurobarometer, namely that uh, poll that's been made. Uh, and uh, the last poll we have is last autumn, still shows a support for the Euro in the Eurozone around 70% and on average, and, uh, and it's uh, over 50% in all countries. But 56% of the Dutch would prefer a future outside of the EU, another opinion poll I'm showed. So, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quoting the Eurobarometer now. Second point is, um, is basically um, that, as I said, if you ask the ECB president, he will say, he will tell you that the Euro has been a success. And so it's only a matter of time for the citizens of the Eurozone, all citizens, because 70% already understand that, but, uh, but the others will soon acknowledge the benefits of this. Third, uh, last week, uh, well, 10 days ago, I'd been invited to give a speech at the Jean Monnet Foundation. On that occasion, I had the opportunity to read some of his, uh, of his writings. In his view, there was no doubt that the sequence is single market, single currency, political union. And that's still the case. But is it tomorrow? No. When is it? We don't know. Why? Because you need to satisfy the two conditions, namely trust, trust in the compliance with the rules, trust in the compliance with the governance of the Eurozone, and convergence. We can't have a union with divergent countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And excuse me, just let me add, and we can't have a union where you have permanent debtors and permanent creditors. There has to be convergence. Thank you. Thank you. With those words, I would like to close this meeting, but not before I've actually uh, thanked uh, Mr. Draghi for accepting the invitation, but also for the good discussion. There are notes, minutes of the meeting or of the introduction statement are on the website of the, of the parliament. So that's, uh, there's a printout of the introduction, introductionary statement. But first of all, or lastly, I would like to thank you. And also, we have, for that, we have bought you a small uh, memento. And it's very unusual that we, uh, that we do that. But we thought it was quite special that you accepted our invitation. And um, there's a st small story to the memento. It's in this nice bag of our parliament. Uh, but I was thinking, can we do something related to this topic? Could you please have a few more minutes? Can it, some, can it be something related to this topic? Because, of course, we are more than, you have seen, we are more than interested in this topic of monetary policy. Is that because it is influences our people and, and, and companies? Yes. 
Is it because as Dutch we are sort of wary of sailing in uncharted waters, as Mr. van Weyenberg uh, mentioned? But actually I think more fundamental is that the first financial crisis which was heavily studied was a financial crisis here in the Netherlands. And it's a memento of that crisis that I would like to give you. And it's the crisis of the tulip, tulip. bubble. <laughs> and so what we hope is that before your next conference or any other conference, look at this tulip yes. in, the, in your window side. It runs on solar energy, so it's also sponsored by our green parties. <laughs> But look at it and think of us and also of this very uh, productive discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.